you stand with us this morning as we enter into worship? This song is the gospel, every bit of it. And so as we sing, be reminded of this truth that we live in. As we sing that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. So join with us.
for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship.
The Apostle Peter said, For this cause the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. In just a few moments, we're going to open the altars. We're going to continue to worship and whatever may be in your life, in your family, in your business, a stronghold that needs to come down. We're going to pray for you that in this day, today, right now, that that will be broken in your life, that the spirit of darkness has controlled, ruled, oppressed. Every one of us has some of that in our life somewhere, and our Lord is the only one who has the keys that can unlock that door. He'll unlock them for you. First, let's fill our mind and heart with the Word of God by reading together Psalm 68. Please read with me. Rise up, O God, and scatter your enemies. Let those who hate God run for their lives. Blow them away like smoke. Melt them like wax in a fire. Let the wicked perish in the presence of God. But let the godly rejoice. Let them be glad in God's presence. Let them be filled with joy. Sing praises to God and to His name. Sing loud praises to Him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in His presence. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy, but he makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Oh God, when you led your people out from Egypt, when you marched through the dry wasteland, the earth trembled and the heavens poured down rain before you, the God of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You sent abundant rain, O God, to refresh the weary land, and there your people settled. And with a bountiful harvest, O God, you provided for your needy people. This is the word of the Lord. Is there anybody here that can say amen to this? This has occurred in your life. Then we're going to continue to worship God. I want all the, the deacons, prayer partners, pastors, will you come and stand right now? And if you would like to take some time to present before the Lord your need, your petition, they're going to pray with you right now as we continue to worship the Lord. Amen.
song. The altar will still be open. If you need prayer, please come forward. This is a safe place where you can bring your needs before the body. You can have a seat um, as we still continue this prayerful worship time here.
know about y'all, but when I get to talking about what Jesus will do, oh, I get excited. It's not no mamby pamby for me. Ah, oh, when I was out there serving the devil, I gave him all. But let me tell you, I got more to give Jesus. Ah, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because I know it will. Whatever you need. If it's a relationship, he will. He will. If it's finances, I know he will. If you're sick in your body, I know he will. I know he will. Ain't no doubt in my mind, Prince. I know. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. John, thank you for sharing with us this morning. Thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you're good. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the multitude expression of the gifts of God in the people of God and for a place where they can all be used and celebrated. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We invite all of our children now to go to the factory. God bless you. We love you. We're glad you're here. Amen. This is Stella Brinesfield. Brinsfield. I even asked you how to pronounce it and mess, still mess it up. Brinsfield. Yeah. All right. You're going to get that maybe in your life. People miss you. just have to set them straight. Hmm. The word of the Lord says in the Gospel of St. Luke, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. He was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. We're still doing that today. We've been doing it since Abraham. I always think, you know, war, famine, nations rising and falling. Surely there'll come a time when there's, not, there's a generation that just doesn't want to follow the Lord. But that has never happened in all these thousands of years. And it's not happening now because we dedicate our children to the Lord. Children that are born to a Christian family are part of the covenant family. They get to make their decision on their own later on, but... They're not ready for that now. We make the decision for them now. And that's contrary to the way the world thinks, but that's the way we think. And that's the way we've been thinking since Abraham. Train up a child in the ways to go, and when he's old, he won't depart. That's what we do. That's what we practice. The privilege of parenthood is God-given, and you're responsible to him for the way you rear your child. And it's fitting that you should come and present Stella to the Lord today to present her to the Lord. So we celebrate with you. And I want to ask, do you, the members of this church, receive Stella in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and promise to be to her fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and friends? If so, would you say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do. And do you, parents, dedicate Stella to the Lord and promise as elder children of your heavenly Father to pray for and with her that she will grow in the knowledge and the love of the Lord? If so, would you say we will. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to anoint Stella. We're going to anoint our heads that she would think the thoughts of Christ, and our hands that she would do the work of Christ, and her feet that she'd walk 
in the ways of Christ. Lord, we thank you for this family, this godly family that loves you. And we pray now, Lord, as we lay our hands upon them, that they will be the hands of God being laid upon them. And Lord, I pray now for Stella as she grows up in a world very different than the world I grew up in. Things are changing so quickly, but they've changed before. And you always prove yourself to be a sufficient God and Savior and provider in every age. We dedicate her to you. We pray, oh God, this will be the compass of her life. The true north is always her relationship with God that she will learn in the bosom of her family and her church. We ask in Jesus' name. All God's people said amen. Amen. Please direct your attention to the screen. Good morning. My name is Jennifer, and here are just some of the many great events that you need to know about. Our Kid Park Club Night Kickoff is next Wednesday, August the 21st at 6.30 for children three years old through sixth grade. The cost is $25 per child, which includes the activity books, t-shirts, and badges. The nursery will also be available. Please pick up the registration form at the Kid Park Center and feel free to contact Janice Blanchett with any questions at Janice at ccnash.org. This Tuesday, August the 20th, we are offering the altar care training at 6.30 p.m. in the Wallace Chapel. If you feel called to the altar care team, are a member at the church, and have completed the What Christ Church Believes and Teaches class, join us for this powerful time of training with Jackie Stanfield. For more information, please contact Amanda Beam at amanda.beam at ccnash.org. Next Sunday, August 25th, we are partnering with the Red Cross for a blood drive. Stop by the Red Cross bus in the Wallace Chapel parking lot from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and help support this great cause. For more information, contact Don Peary at donp at ccnash.org. Registration is in full swing for our new community group, Faith Moms. Beginning September 13th, this group will meet weekly on Friday mornings from 10 to 11.30 a.m. at the Christ Church YMCA to build strong bonds and mentoring relationships among mom of all ages. Free childcare will also be provided. Please register with Rebecca Robinson at her table by the Kid Park Center or email her at ccfaithmoms at yahoo.com. And those are just some of the many great events happening at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at any information desk. I want to add one more announcement to that. Next Sunday night here at 6.30, Benny Prasad will be here. Now, Benny's been a friend of Christ Church for many years. He uh, travels the world. In fact, he's been to every single recognized country on the planet with passport to prove it. His passport's about this big because I keep having to make a new one and add to it. But Benny uh, has some amazing stories, um, not, not just because of his travels, but how he got into these countries and what he did while he was in those countries with the gospel. And so, uh, well, Benny is going to be settling down. So this is probably our last time to, to host him and to, be a, to hear from him directly. So make plans to come out. He is getting married, and he's going to settle down and pastor a church is what I understand. And so um, his, his life is about to change. But we love Benny around here, and I hope that you'll take the time, especially if you've never heard his story, uh, come out um, and spend time with us next Sunday night. That will take place in the Elevate Worship Center, which is uh, located beyond the breezeway. It's otherwise known as our youth center. Uh, so make sure you come out next Sunday night at 630. Well, we want to welcome all of our first-time guests. If this is your first time to Christ Church, I like to tell people we're the perfect church for an imperfect people because uh, all of us here are, is, are we're just a makeup of a bunch of people that have, have uh, made a mess of our lives. Some of us are really religious, and we're trying to overcome that as well, and it's just everything in between. So I just want to ask you, if, if you are perfect, please don't come here and mess it up for the rest of us. So can I get a big amen from everyone who knows you're not uh, perfect? All right, good. So if you will, if this is your first time here, lift your hand with me. The usher wants to give you a card. We just ask that you fill that card out. Join us in the hospitality room after the service. 
We'd like to give you a gift, give you some refreshments, and also, of course, give you information about our community and take a moment to get to know you. And so you'll find the hospitality room located here in the foyer on your left. The ushers are going to come back now to receive our tithes and offerings. And as Christians, we give um, for several reasons. And one of the big reasons that I give is it reminds me every time I write that check that I'm giving back a, to him a portion of what he's given to me. And that it's all his, but this portion is designated for his work, his kingdom work that happens in this church and around the world. And so that's why I give. And uh, some of us give because we feel compelled to. We feel guilty if we don't give. And as a pastor in a church, I'm going to tell you, give anyway. Go ahead, because uh, you're helping pay my salary, and I really appreciate that. And so, um, you know, if preachers aren't honest with you, that one reason they need you to give is to sustain the budget. They're lying to you, aren't they? It's part of the deal. And so we might as well own that and be honest with you. But the reason I give really is because I've come to learn to trust in him, that he gives me everything anyway, and so a portion of my income does go to his work. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be a part of your kingdom work and to remind ourselves that you are the provider of all things, and we trust you with everything. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my Most of you know already that we are having a party today. We are celebrating 30 years of wonderful ministry by Mercy Ministries. And we thank God for that. And Nancy, uh, we all know who Nancy is here in Nashville, and especially in Christ Church, and how effective and wonderful her ministry has been, and how it's inspired many of us to launch out and do things for God as well. I'm not going to give Nancy's glowing introduction today, though, because I want somebody else to do it. I wanted Pastor Hardwick to do that. So what he's going to do, he's going to tell you a, 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 just a, a little bit, a brief uh, uh, introduction of her and how he came to know her and how Mercy began. Then there's going to be a short video presentation, and then Nancy will be speaking. And when she does, she's got a word from God for you today. 
And when she comes up here, let's give her the kind of Christ Church uh, welcome and show her how much we love and appreciate her and her ministry. Pastor Hardwick. Nancy, why don't, why don't you come up here? I'm going to ask Nancy to come up because at 81 years old, I don't remember a whole lot of things. And I wouldn't dare ask Nancy how old she is, but I know she's young enough she'll remember all the details. Hey, hey, stay close here. <laughs> do you remember? Yes. You do? Okay. What is it you remember? I remember uh, when I was still working for the government in 1978 when you had just opened the new building up on the hillside here. I came over, snuck into the which was your primary service back then, the Sunday That's night right. service. That's right. Fell in love with the choir, and you would take all of us out to eat after every service. And I loved hanging out with you because I would always get to eat. That's right. That's right. And I always took you to real good places like the Crystal. Yeah, yeah, Places yeah, yeah. like that. You yeah. Know. It was the place that had, uh, what was it, the uh, mm -hmm. steak and biscuits. Remember was that it? place? Yeah, but I thought I always took you to Merrill's Restaurant. Yeah, there, there sometime too. Steak and biscuits. Ireland's. Ireland's. Yeah. Ireland's. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. right. Merrill's and Ireland's both have gone out of business. The yeah. reason, I guess, is because that I'm getting older and I don't have time enough to take everybody by there. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Merrill died. I guess you knew that. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's talk about we. you were in uh, Louisiana. Right. And some way, Christchurch, we, we began to feel like we needed to do something along the lines of helping uh, girls that found themselves in, in the situation where they needed help. And did I call you? Yes. Uh, I have been, I left Nashville by the direction of the Lord to go start the first home in West Monroe, Louisiana. And actually, I uh, had been there about seven years and felt that God was tugging on my heart that this was not just going to be a one-home thing. And, and I felt like God was saying, go back to Nashville to open a place. And I said, Lord, that's where my family is, my nieces, my nephews, so you're going to have to confirm to me. And when I, while I was praying for confirmation, you picked up the phone and called me, and I had not talked to you in seven or eight years. As I recall, we, we talked about this with the church board. And uh, we knew that we did not have the know-how to, to start something like this. So that's when I thought of you because right. I knew what you were doing and called you. And ultimately, uh, apparently the Lord had been working on your heart, right. working right. on this end of the line. He gets us all together. And you come up here and you and I talk about it. And then we go around, I think, 44 or 45 different churches. That's right. And I don't think a single one of them preachers helped us. No. They, they've sent a lot of girls to us since then, though. They sure have. Well, I understand the reason for that is because preachers like me, pastors like Dan and myself, we have our own uh, vision of what we're, God's calling us to do, and, and each of them had that vision, and I guess they could not imagine what, what would occur. But ultimately, uh, we, you bought this. You started out over on 21st and Blair. In a little office suite. That's right. And then, do you remember what year you came over here? Uh, we bought the property in 1991, mm -hmm. and we uh, took us about four or five years to get the money together to build the building debt-free, but we cut the ribbon on it at the end of 1995. 1995 and moved over here. And uh, you got any idea how many girls have come through there? Oh, it's thousands. I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many for sure, but we've had several thousand. And, all the homes. Nancy has done an amazing work. How many different homes do you have going around the country now? We have, uh, we're working on number five in the United States and we have three internationally. Five in the USA and three internationally. And thousands upon thousands of girls. Girls, stand up. Will you do that? Let's give them a great big hand. Amen. <laughs> All right. 
And God bless you, Nancy, for all that you've done and that, that you're going to continue to do. Now, I'm 81 years old, and if you were a man, I'd ask you how old you are. But being a lady, we never ask ladies. <laughs> but I know we're going to ask the Lord to give you 50 more okay. great, wonderful I'll years. I'll take it. Everybody that you be in favor of Nancy doing this work for another 50 years, say amen. amen. God bless you, Nancy. I love you, girl. I love you, too. Thank you so much. Right. I want to give you a, a brief glimpse. Uh, you know, when we connect with Pastor Hardwick and Christ Church, it just seemed like Mercy Ministries actually uh, catapulted into uh, to a whole different level, and that means all of you are a part of that. So I want to give you just a, a few minutes, a glimpse through this DVD of kind of the growth that's happened, and then I'll come back. My favorite person when I was little was my best friend. Our whole summer is spent out at the lakes. We always just had so much fun together. I had a very happy childhood. I remember my favorite place with my dad is going to the park and having picnics, playing in the playground. I can remember my life being happy and good until I was five years old and had my first sexual experience with my uncle. for 10 years. By the time I was eight, my uncle began to pay me for any sexual activity. Going to school with a lot of money, that felt good. And when I was about 12, there was a member at the church that started to molest me. I started to think that that's the lifestyle that I was destined for. There was a group of boys in my school that started to sexually harass me. My perception on life started to change that in order to get other people's attention, I needed to look nice. I started being very promiscuous, manipulative, controlling. I started prostituting. I'd get raped, and I never left the situation like, man, I just got raped. I was more thinking, I hope I actually make my money tonight. I turned to drugs and alcohol. Bottles and bottles of alcohol. Prescription pills. Pills. Marijuana. I started cutting. I started to cut a lot. I went into the hospital. Pulling in my hair. First abortion. Hitting myself. And I ended up in jail at 17 years old. And I woke up every single day just wanting to die. I almost wanted to match my scars on the outside to match the scars inside so people could see that I was hurting. I don't know if anybody knows the feeling of being a human, but not feeling like a human. And I was so mad at God for that. A couple months later, I got pregnant. That's when I decided that I should apply to Mercy Ministries. Mercy Ministries is a residential Christian-based program. We take in young women ages 13 to 28. They stay with us an average of six months, free of charge. It's for the young women who choose to come and deal with their issues. I walked into the home, <laughs> I bawled. <laughs> we deal with issues such as eating disorders, self-harm, addictions, unplanned pregnancy, girls who have been horribly sexually abused, even young women who have come out of sex trafficking. They loved on me. That was something nobody had ever done we have several residential facilities in the United States and internationally, and we are moving forward to begin other locations as well. I actually felt like I was important for the first time in my life. The best thing about Mercy is the tools they give you to constantly stay in the Word, to constantly be seeking God's guidance in all things. Taught us a lot about mind, body, and soul, and how to eat well and take care of your body, and how to exercise. Mercy was awesome. <laughs> if I were to paint a picture of my life in the future, I'd see myself being a motivational speaker and helping other women get past the abuse. When you give to Mercy, you are literally making the difference between life and death. I found this life that I did not think exist.
Father, we just thank you that you are the one who heals broken hearts and sets captives free. And Lord, we give you honor and glory and praise for every single girl that has walked through the doors, not just of the Nashville home, but every home across the United States and in the other nations. And Lord, I thank you that you are not a God who um, just tries to rehabilitate, but you are a God who transforms us. You, bring, you give us a new heart and a new spirit, and you set us free because of what Jesus did on the cross. We receive our freedom, spirit, soul, and body. And Lord, I thank you for the 40 girls that are represented here this morning. And I thank you that the same work that you've done in the girls all the years before that you are also doing in these young women. And Father, I thank you that they are my heroes because they are willing to come and deal with some of the most painful issues that life could ever throw at anyone. So we honor them today and we honor you for the work that you are doing in them. And I thank you for this church. I thank you for, the, for a church that is so supportive and, and so behind what we do as a ministry. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I figured out that if I have 50 more years, Pastor Harbick, I'm going to be 108. So I, I, I had to think about if I wanted to agree with that prayer or not, but I guess I will. Maybe you'll still be around too. Who knows? Um, I just want to start out this morning by saying... I know that Linda Hilliard and quite a few people, Pastor Dan, have, have done a lot of work behind the scenes in Colleen to make this day possible. But I will be honest with you, when I walked in here this morning, uh, I was handed this happy 30th anniversary card, and I, di I didn't even know that's what we were doing today. So um, I just, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, because... When, when Pastor Hardwick called me, not only did he take me around to see 40 pastors that welcomed me because of him, he lended his name and influence to me. He was a father to the city, and he took his father key, and he unlocked doors for me. And, but the biggest thing that he did is he let me speak in this pulpit and on, on a number of Sunday mornings to speak out the vision of what now is a reality right next door. And because of that foundation that was laid, now all these other homes exist in all the other places that you just saw. And uh, we opened up, uh, we, we rented an office suite in the Kennard building over on 21st, which still stands there to this day, 21st and Blair. And, and on February in 1991, I made one of the best decisions that I have ever made in my whole life. And that's the day that I hired Judy Jones to become our, our very first full-time Nashville employee. And Judy is still with Mercy to this day. And many of you are aware that about three weeks ago, uh, Judy got hit with a viral infection that, that she has literally had to, uh, um, along with the prayer warriors in this church and the prayer warriors at Mercy Ministries and a, a network of prayer networks all over the country and even some in other countries have been standing in the gap and declaring and decreeing that Judy will live, she will be fully restored, she will fulfill her destiny, and I believe with all my heart, you know, doctors, we love doctors, but when they put their natural in and they do everything they can do, but then we pray and God comes and puts his super on the natural and we see the power of God in operation. And the, they gathered to tell Judy's family that they didn't see any way she could recover. And we said, no, that's not the way it's going to go. And a whole bunch of you guys did too. And Judy's family did too. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. And I don't know, we, this church needs Judy. Judy's family needs Judy. Mercy Ministries needs Judy. The world needs Judy. Everybody that works at Mercy Ministries now says that Ju Judy is who they want to be like when they grow up. And I'm 58 years old, and I want to be like Judy when I grow up. She is one of the most beautiful people that God ever made. And our staff, if we had our, our staff, she's the most treasured, cherished of all of our staff. And, and we're celebrating 30 years. And Judy has been with, with me and with our team 
for almost 23 of the 30 years. So I am happy to report to you that Judy came out of that coma. Judy is making progress every day. And I, I want you to agree with this declaration that I'm about to make, that Judy Jones is healed by the stripes of Jesus and that she will fully recover, that she will fully be restored. And I want to dedicate this service to Judy this morning. And I am so excited about the progress that she's making. And uh, Judy, you know, a lot of people use this verse in the negative in Galatians where it says, do not be deceived for God shall not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Well, I don't know if you if you never had a tour of Mercy Next Door or a tour of our office building. I would love to give you a tour sometime. You give us a call and or drop by and we'll give you a tour. But there's a prayer room over here on the third floor of our office building, and Judy, Judy's office, and my sister who also works with with Mercy, Judy and Rebecca should have the office right together, and they're always in that prayer room. But Judy's over our prayer room, and Judy has prayed literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of prayers on behalf of other people. And so I understand that we reap what we sow, but in Judy's case, that's a good thing because she's reaping prayers from people all over the world. And I'm excited and I cannot wait because I anticipate a time not too far off in the future that Judy will stand right here on this podium and give testimony to the healing power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So I know that some of Judy's family sitting up here, we love you guys. We're standing with you and you know we are and we're going to see this thing all the way through. I mean all the way through. So and, and Judy, I, I just uh, if you want to know what people think of Judy, go on that Karen Bridge thing. There's over 300 entries on there. You'll find out real fast. And uh, our staff came together and had, had, have had special times of prayer and fasting and believing God. And we know it's the will of God for her to come through this. And we have the word of God on it. So we're standing on that word and we're thanking God for that. But uh, I just wanted to honor her today because Judy has been a part of this church, Pastor Harvick, since you started it, I guess. And uh, you perform so anyway, it, it, it's exciting to, to be able to stand here and talk about Judy because I don't, know any, I don't know of a better person than Judy. And I think that if there were more of us like Judy, that there would be way more, uh, way more people in the world that know Jesus Christ. Because we're living in a time where people are way more interested in what comes out of our life than what comes out of our mouth. And Judy... Jones is a person who lives the life every day. And her office is always lined up with people who want her advice about something because they see the reality of who she is and just the godliness of her. And uh, so I just so honor her and I'm just so excited about uh, the, the healing that is in process and the fact that she's gonna be fully restored in Jesus name. I want, the verse that I wanna share with you this morning um, is in Matthew 7. You know, we, I want to thank you as a church for loving our girls, particularly this 11 o'clock service because they feel loved here. They feel like safe that they can come up to the altar. I don't know if you noticed how many of them came up to the altar this morning to get prayer, but they feel loved here. They feel safe here. We get regular testimonies of what God has done in their lives through prayer times and things that happen here, or maybe words that different ones of you give them. So I want to thank you for that. And this morning in between services, I did uh, a book signing for my new book, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And uh, one of the young girls who graduated from our home, she's, she goes to this church to this day, but she went through the home a number of years ago. Her life was a mess and she brought her husband and her four children to me so that we could get a picture. Now that's, that's what God has in store for you girls in the future. Now, if you don't want four kids and it could just be two, so don't freak out on me. <laughs> but, but, but her life was a mess and the point is she's doing amazing. And that's the kind of work that God does. He works in us 
both to will and to do his good pleasure. And, and I spent eight years working for the government. And I saw girls that were supposed to be get, get help, but we were told in government work, you cannot share Jesus Christ, separation of church and state. So girls, they didn't get the help they needed, and they'd go home and die from drug overdoses, get killed in street gang fights, end up in the women's prison after they pass the age of 18. And some of them felt so hopeless because the, the psychiatrists and the psychologists that didn't know the Lord would run all these tests on them and tell them all the reasons why they were damaged goods. You'll never be able to overcome this. You'll never be able to do that. And those girls would leave there feeling so bad about themselves and feeling like that they were a reject and a castaway and a throwaway. Many of those young women took their own life before their 18th birthday because nobody uh, told them you can be new, you can be forgiven, you can have the shame and guilt and condemnation lifted off of you. God will meet you right where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done or what was done to you, God wants to restore. And that verse that, that Pastor Dan uh, uh, quoted this morning, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus Christ did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And after working with the government for eight years and being told that I couldn't share Christ, I was a very frustrated individual. And I can sum it up in one sentence. God has not anointed the government to heal broken hearts and set captives free. He's called us to do it. And we've got to be willing to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we can't be moved by what they've done or what, they're, what they look like. The beautiful young African-American girl who was in that video just now that you saw, and she talked about living the life of a prostitute and, and doing drugs. And the white girl talked about the drugs and all the shame and all the stuff that they have been through. Both of those girls are strongly serving God today. And Sophie, the African-American young woman, she went on a ministry trip with me to Delaware two weeks ago and shared her testimony three different times and had tremendous impact on the lives of those she was speaking to. And there are girls coming to mercy as a result of her testimony that are applying for mercy right now to come. And they felt like they had no hope. But Sophie now knows that she, she even stood in the, in the, on the podium and she said, I used to be. Remember when the apostle Paul said, I used to be this. I used to be that. I was a persecutor of the church. I was involved in murdering Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death, fully consenting to his death, the Bible says. And Sophie stood and she said, I used to be a prostitute. But today... I know what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if I confess my sin, that God is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So she said, I've made a commitment to God, this is powerful, that sex is for marriage, and I know that when God looks at me, he sees me as if I'm a virgin, and that is absolutely the truth, according to the authority of God's word. We need to get a revelation that the Bible is true, and, the, and if it says it, it means it. How, what, what do we see when we see somebody on a street corner selling their body? What do we see when we see somebody in gangs selling drugs? What rises up in us when we see tattoos and all kinds of crazy nose rings and whatever kind of rings? They're everywhere now. What do we see? I know that, that the, the culture of today's world probably challenges us in a big way not to judge. And there may be a reason why God put the word creature and in go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because to us, some of us, they look like creatures, right? But you know what? God wants us to love people unconditionally and not be moved by what they look like or what they're into or what they do or whether they live up to our, our standard or whether they dress like us. I mean, bottom line is if we get threatened by people like that, then we need to deal with our own insecurity. So if God met us, right where we were when we called out to him, and he did, and he does, then we need to be willing to meet people wherever they are. 
And we let God, he's, he, he does, you know, we tr I remember when we, when I worked for the government, it was always behavior modification. Y'all know what that is, right? You try to change people from the outside. But only Jesus Christ can put a new heart and a new spirit inside of a person and change their desires. And when we're born again, we may have been born into a bloodline of drugs and pornography and sex addiction and all kinds of things. But when we receive Christ, that's why the term born again, what the term born again means, that the bloodline of Jesus Christ supersedes the bloodline that we were born into. And in Christ, the curse is broken. And we can, by the power of our choice to serve God, start, stop a generation generational curses and start a generational a blessing. And that's what our mercy girls do. By the power of their choice to serve Christ and to renounce the past and to believe that they are now daughters of the king, they start a generation of blessing. And there are thousands that have graduated now and it's being perpetuated through the generations. That's why we themed our anniversary celebration from generation to generation because it's about the generations and, and God's promises to bless the generations and that we can leave a legacy. And I want to tell you guys that, um, you know, I started, when I started in 83, in 1991, about three months before September 11th happened, um, my dad passed away. And we, had, we were just getting ready to, we had built the girls' home and been operating there, and we had just built our office building, and we were getting ready to move into that office building. And um, I was shocked by all the, that surfaced in me after my dad died, all kinds of issues that I was dealing with. And I knew that I needed help. But I was just trying to, you know, I'm supposed to have it all together because I'm the head of a ministry, right? So, you know, I didn't really seek help. I was just trying to cope with it all by myself. And I don't know why we think we're supposed to do that because we're not. Accountability is a good thing. Counsel is a good thing. The Bible teaches us that we all need each other. And that's just pressure that we put on ourselves, and it's not what God, the kind of pressure God puts on us. And so I thank, thank God for good friends because I had a good friend in my life at that time. And she called me one day. She lived in another state, and she called me. She had seen me struggling for several months. And she said, I see all the girls you're helping. I see all that God's using you to do. But she said, look, I'm seeing your life, and you're a mess, and you need to get help. And she said, get a pen, legal pad out and take these names down. She gave me five names, five phone numbers, and she said, look at your watch and tell me what time it is. So I looked, I remember it was 4.45 in the afternoon. She said, okay, you have exactly 20, I just gave you the names, I did my research and I just gave you the five names of the five top rated Christian counselors in Nashville. And you have exactly 24 hours to call me back and tell me that you made an appointment with one of these people. And Brother Hardwick, Margaret Phillips' name was on the list. And she's the one that I called. I called her 23 hours and 45 minutes later, I beat the deadline by 15 minutes. And you know why I waited so long? Because I was listening to the voice of the enemy because he was screaming in my ear, what are people going to think about you? You're supposed to be a leader. What are people going to think about you? You're supposed to have it all together. What are people going to think about me? My dad just died and I needed help. Why do we put that pressure on ourselves? I don't know if you lead a company. I don't know if you lead a ministry. I don't know if you've been in a leader in a ministry and maybe you've fallen. But I know one thing for sure. If my friend had not challenged me to go to counseling and I hadn't done it, I probably wouldn't still be leading Mercy today. And my point is that we're all just people. And we are all just trying to do a good work for God. And some of us, when we stand up here, hopefully we're anointed to preach the word of God, but when we walk down from this platform, we have to walk it out just like every other human being. There's no special gift to walk it out. And so, and so finally, what gave me the courage to call and make the appointment was number one, my friend was holding me accountable. Accountability is a good thing. Yes, Secondly, and that's the kind of friends you need, friends that'll hold you accountable. If you surround yourself with yes people, you're already in trouble. 
The second reason I had the courage to call is because I figured out that counselors, professional counselors are bound by laws of confidentiality so that nobody would ever know that I was going and I could just sneak over there. I'm just being honest. And so I started going and I went what I thought would be a few sessions for a few weeks and then it'd all be okay. Well, guess what? Seven years later, I was still going to see Margaret Phillips every week. And about two or three months into it, I was so excited about all that God was doing inside of me that I got my staff together and I told them I was seeing a counselor and I started just sharing with them what happened and then I'd go speak at a conference in Australia or, or Lakewood Church or somewhere like that and thousands of people and I'd, I'd tell them, I'm, guess what, I'm going to counsel. Let me tell you why and this is what God's doing and I was just so excited about it. And without me realizing it, I was giving people permission that needed permission to get help instead of trying to deal with their own issues when they needed someone to come alongside and help share that burden with them and help pray them through that. So God just started dealing with me a couple of years ago that he wanted me to, you know, I've been comfortable for 30 years talking about the why behind the what of these young women. You saw the innocence of Sophony as a five-year-old little girl playing with dolls. You saw that, right? And then her uncle comes on the scene and begins to abuse her sexually and use her sexually. So she, when she was an innocent little girl playing with a doll, she didn't say, I think I'd like to be a prostitute when I grow up. There was a process that occurred. There were things that happened in her life that caused her to be the way she turned out to be. And thank God, he said, I'm not going to allow my precious daughter to be mistreated because God understood Sophony's why behind her what. And do you know that every human being on the planet, I don't care how hard core they may seem. I don't care what girl you see on the street corner. I don't care what guy you see on the street corner or in a gang or whatever. Every, those Vanderbilt players that just got arrested, everybody has a why behind the what. Am I saying does that make it okay for them to do what they did? No, I'm not saying that it makes it okay, but I'm saying that the challenge for us as believers to understand that they didn't just suddenly decide to go out and do this, that, and the other, but there is something that happened to them along the way. And Jesus, Satan said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we are to be God's representatives in the earth. So if we're going to represent him well, then we've got to learn to love people where they are, to love them unconditionally, not to judge them after their sin. You know, in Psalm 103, God says, I have not reward, I have not uh, rewarded you after your sin nor after your iniquity. Aren't you glad? I sure am. I sure am glad. And so what God, what God asked me to do, and, and this is a, a chapter that I want to share with you, because if we're going to represent Christ well in the earth and we're supposed to be his ambassadors and his representatives, then we've got to learn to judge ourselves. and not other people. We judge ourselves, and we love other people. And love never fails. But in order to, to uh, appropriately love people unconditionally and have God's perspective about the individuals that he brings across our path, we have to judge ourselves first because if we don't, our perspective won't be right. And let me share this, this, this passage very quickly. Matthew 7, verse 1 through 5. Judge not that you... Be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, so go back to me starting to go to counseling 2001. I think that my plank was probably pride, 
because I didn't want anybody to know I, was, I needed to go to counseling. So that was one of my planks. Another one of my planks was probably self-righteousness. Another one of my plant planks was probably comparing myself to other people. Well, compared to that person, I mean, you can always find somebody that you can come out on top of if you want to start the comparing game. Brother Harvey used to work at the, uh, uh, be the chaplain at the men's prison. I'm sure that you could feel good about yourself if you compared yourself to all those guys over there. Great. You're great. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> he is great. But God said, Nancy, if you are going to have the right perspective for the long haul to deal with the issues that I bring through your doors and you're going to be able to be the kind of leader that I want you to be so that your staff can respect you. Because I had all this unresolved anger and just, oh my gosh. If Judy was here, she could tell you all about it. Ask her when she comes back. But anyhow, but I needed help. Even though, I, even though I was leading a ministry, you know what the Lord said to me? If ministry leaders would deal with their stuff before their stuff deals with them, then they don't have to leave their post. And so God said, you need to take personal responsibility because before, for you to have God's perspective, I've got to get that plank out of your eye so that you can see clearly to get the speck out of someone else's eye. So I would challenge you today if you're someone like I was in 2001 and can still be. And by the way, I still, I don't go see Margaret every week now, but I still do go see her. I've been to see her several times this year. And uh, we all need people in our life that we can be accountable to. We need to make sure that we are continually examining ourselves and judging ourselves. And if we judge ourselves, then we won't have to be judged. And we'll be able to love people unconditionally. So this story is my why behind my what. This is all, never tell God never, because I told God I would never write this stuff in a book. And I started about age eight uh, out of my own life. Very comfortable telling their stories and their stories, but not mine. And I start when I'm about eight years old. And, and I've, I share very deep, intimate stuff in here that was very painful. I cried a lot of tears writing this book. It just came out. And there's two things this book will do for you. It will help you, it give you permission to deal with anything you might need to deal with and feel great about it. And the second half of the book, will, will, you will have so much faith, because I share a few other stories of other people. You will have so much faith with the last half of the book that when you look at a person, you'll believe that God has the power to change anybody, everybody, no matter what the problem is, Jesus is the answer, and he can transform anyone. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. He's able to save to the uttermost, and there is absolutely nothing too hard for him. That's why I cannot wait to see um, Judy walking and leaping and praising God. Because the same Jesus Christ that died for our sins, he also died for our emotional healing. He died for our physical healing. Isaiah 53 is a full account. He paid the price for all of it. So I just want to encourage you guys up in that corner today. God is on the throne. He's on the job. And, and we're going to see this thing all the way through. And so, Lord, we thank you ahead of time for raising Judy up and for all you're going to do in her life. Because you know what? He's not done with Judy yet. We need her. You need her. I need her. They need her, okay? And uh, I need you, and thank God I have you, to help us do what we do at Mercy. We have the best staff on the planet. Judy is one of them. And if any of you guys try to hire any of my staff away from me, then you just made a way for them to get a raise because I'm not going to let you have them. That's how good they are. And uh, so anyway, I, I really appreciate it. I've probably gone over my time a little bit, but I do have my new book available today. And I also, we have a 30 anniversary magazine. We brought uh, copies for you to take as many as you want. Uh, there's a 30 year timeline in here that you'll really be blessed by. And these issue related books, cutting, addictions, eating disorders, sexual abuse, we're getting testimonies from men and women. These books were written for people who, are, who do not come to a place called mercy, but they come to a, a, a God of mercy. 
and they receive their help in time of need. These books are filled with principles of freedom, and if you can't afford them, we'll give them to you because we just want to see people get set free by the power of God, and we're sick and tired of, of the experts of the world who do not know God telling people they were just born this way and there's nothing you can do about it because that is a lie. And so we are here to proclaim liberty and freedom to the physical and spiritual captives, no matter what their problem may be. Jesus is the answer, and don't believe anything less, because God said that he came to redeem and restore all that the enemy has stolen. Amen? Thank you. Yeah, real quick before you get in that, because I know that's really important. This Sunday, or this Wednesday night, we have a Journey to Freedom group that is starting. Yeah, yeah. And Journey to Freedom, I just did Journey to Freedom. One day I'm going to tell my story too, Nancy. Thanks for your courage. But Journey to Freedom, I spent eight weeks. It's just a short commitment. And found out that I'm just like everyone else. Right? I knew that. But I also had these corners of my heart and life that I thought that I couldn't tell, couldn't share. Made me made me feel really alone and ashamed. And so I got in this group with a bunch of people, and uh, we just all told our story, and just stuff began to come down. And I spent the last week doing more work like that in my own heart and life. And um, We don't pitch Journey to Freedom because it's some kind of program that makes us look good or makes the church any money. It's just because it's there because... If you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're at that place to just, you want to get real and you're not sure how, uh, it's a place to help you do that. And you don't have to talk. You don't have to participate. You can actually just sit there. And um, so that my, my journey to freedom group ended. And so I've got plans to start to be in another group. And I can't envision my life without counseling or, or group care um, for the rest of my life. Um, because what you find out is God moves in the brokenhearted. You know, a, a wounded person, a person with a broken spirit, a contrite heart, God won't despise. But man, when all that pride and arrogance and self-reliance, all that keeps us from getting to freedom. It's not, it's not necessarily because God's, it's not because God's kicked us to the curb that he won't help us. It's just that until you're willing to say, I need help, it just, no help can work. And... Um, I just want to encourage you. It is this Wednesday night at 6.30. And if you're like, I don't want to go to a group at Christ Church. Heck, I didn't sign up to go to a group at Christ Church. <laughs> you know, I went to a Methodist church. Do you know there's Methodists that know God? <laughs> Who knew? And uh, that's a joke, people. If you're Methodist, don't get mad. <laughs> Actually, I don't care if you get mad anymore. <laughs> so go ahead. Get ticked. Uh, Shonda La Bahanda. Let's see. Um, no, seriously, if you'll go to the YMCA Restore Ministries and just find we're, we're part of a whole system of support groups. And if you want to drive across town, you want to find one at a weird hour, a weird time, go. But um, just do something. And if you need a, a counselor referral list, uh, you email me, Daniel, at ccnash.org, and I will email you a list, and I'll probably add to it. You've got 24 hours to email me back to let me know you made an appointment. So, Wow. Wow. Well, we're going to receive, I was about to say, and that this is wonderful. I, that's very moving to me. It's very important, you know. The Lord gives us, uh, we can't get it all done here in just this uh, sanctuary setting and sometimes we need some specialized help and and uh, this is wonderful this is a gift to our church when nancy first started with our church our church uh, we we wanted to help her help those poor people that needed help and not realizing that many of us were in need of exactly what she was offering to others my time came a couple years later when uh, i had to go get some help myself and my whole family and uh, we went through that journey, and, and thank God, thank God. But many times God raises up these specialized groups to get out on the edge before we all know that we need this, and then they turn around and they're a blessing. So we help them financially or encourage them to open up their ministry, and then lo and behold, they get expertise and knowledge from the Lord that they pour back into the church. 
And uh, that's what Nancy has done all these years, and especially this morning. Very moving to me. We're going to receive this offering. And please go to her book table. Get a book. Take some time. Thank her for her uh, ministry and her time of these 30 years. And also, uh, the, all these specialty books, i, I got to say something about them. They're so good. I, have, I read the one on cutting because I have dealt with that so often. You, there's somebody you know that cuts. Just, they, there is. Somebody you know cuts. You think, no, yes, absolutely. You read these specialty things even though you don't think you may need them yourself. You'll be shocked when suddenly the Lord just opens your eyes and see all this stuff going around. These, these are wonderful little books. They've come out of, of, of much experience. They're not just theory. We're going, God, God bless you to give what you're capable of giving. You've already been asked to give. This is not for Christ Church. This is to bless Mercy Ministries and the wonderful work. And then when we have finished with the offering, we will dismiss you. So God bless you now as you give. Lord, let your light, light of your face, shine on us. your light, light of your face, shine on us, that we may be saved, that we may have life to find shine on us. Lord, let your grace Lord, let your grace grace from your hand fall on us. Offer this prayer to the Lord. Lord, let your grace grace from your hand fall on us that we may be saved that we may have life and find our way in the dark grace fall on us. What a beautiful service. What a beautiful ministry. And I loved Nancy's message this morning. And often when I pray for the girls, I pray that you would see yourselves as God sees you. And I think Nancy's message this morning gives us permission and to see the why behind the what in, in others' lives, but in ourselves as well. And so I pray for you. I, I hope that each one of us will take what she has said this morning to heart and that we will see ourselves as Christ sees us and that we would start to, to give ourselves permission to see the why behind the what and that we would love each other as God loves us. Amen? What a beautiful, what a beautiful reminder and what a beautiful gift that she's given us. And I hope that we'll all take that to heart. I'm going to pray over us as we dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to see what you're doing, to see about see your transformation, your transforming power in and through the lives of these girls, Lord. And as they come, and I know that sometimes they probably feel they have nothing to offer because of, of where they're coming from, but they, they minister to us, as Jen said, as they as they worship you with pure abandon, Lord. We 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 enjoy that and we learn from that and we cherish that. Lord, I pray that we would soak that in and that we would take those steps of faith too, Lord, that we would let that wash over us. Lord, I pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us, Lord, that you would make your face to shine upon us, Lord, and that you would bring us peace. Lord, I pray that you would bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen.